Yeah, um, Google DeepMind developed a, an algorithm called AlphaGo that defeated the best player of the game of Go, which is com considered as the most uh, difficult and complex board uh, chess game. You have 10 to the power of 70 atoms in the universe, and you have 10 to the power of 182 possibilities of the game of Go. So, AlphaGo defeated the second best player in the game of Go in um, in uh, four times out of uh, five games. Then, a second iteration for AlphaGo Zero defeated uh, a year and a half later uh, AlphaGo 100 to nil in three days. And last December, Alpha Zero uh, achieved superhuman performance in the game of Go, the game of uh, chess and shogi in 36 hours, meaning super intelligence, superhuman uh, capabilities mean being able to uh, to uh, to be any uh, yeah, human, uh, human 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 being. In terms of data, if you look at this graph, the Internet of Things, the fact that uh, you are using more and more connected devices, means that we are generating more and more data. And it is uh, foreseen that by uh, 2020, 2025, we will have more than 20 billion connected devices generating more and more uh, data. The second breakthrough was Libertus, which is a, an algorithm that defeated uh, uh, for the best uh, 10 uh, poker player. At the end of uh, 150,000 hands over three uh, weeks, uh, the computer, the algorithm, uh, defeated the four players, the player that uh, lost the least, lost $80,000, the player that lost the most, $800,000, <laughs> and uh, the algorithm made $1.8 million. Uh, in uh, in game that was a breakthrough. Why? Because in the game of poker, you need to be able to bluff. So not only the algorithm learned how to bluff, but he learned to bluff in a random way. Because if you are a poker pro a professional poker player and you have a pattern of bluffing, you'll be you'll be caught. So here, this is a breakthrough. Why? Because this game, in game theory, is is defined as a game with incomplete information, and this is basically what. Uh, you encounter in human uh, interaction. So now talking about uh, malicious uh, uses <coughs> of AI, uh, this uh, an article uh, was published on 11th of December last year on Motherboard that uh, basically was uh, referring to this experiment. So here you have a uh, an actress, a porn actress. Uh, but her face is not her face. So basically, this is what we call the fake of fake apps. And so what happened was that someone took a picture of a celebrity and merged uh, the, picture, the, the, the face of the celebrity with uh, the movie. So people ask, how long would it take for this uh, technology to democratize? And experts said, well, it would take probably one to two years. Mid-January uh, this year, you had a uh, second um, uh, movie uh, that uh, popped up, and basically this was an application called uh, Deepfake. And on this application, basically, you had the possibility to, uh, to take any pictures and merge it with any movie. On this uh, movie, the next uh, movie that you'll see in a, in, a, in a second, this is the face of Jessica Alba in a important movie. So you can imagine the consequences of that kind of application being in terms of political manipulation. When people talk about post-truth politics, about uh, fake news, this will have tremendous uh, implication. The second concrete, um, uh, this is the second uh, application, this is uh, fake app. The second uh, concrete application is what we call adversarial artificial intelligence. And some researchers, uh, not the least those that are based at the School of Technology in Lausanne, EPFL, started to work on how you can trick the way a, uh, an algorithm can read a picture, for instance. And they realized by just changing a few pixels in uh, the, the picture, or oh, this is. Uh, this is basically uh, the, the movie uh, the, of Jessica Alba. So if you look at that, there's no way you can see that it's a fake. Yeah. So this is adversarial AI. And here in this picture, just by changing a few pixels, uh, the dog that you see there suddenly <coughs> is being interpreted as wool. Or the sock that you see uh, is an Indian elephant. 
for the algorithm. Not only the algorithm misinterprets this, but they have uh, they have made this, per this experiment with all alg algorithms. So all algorithms are tricked by this technique. Some researchers then went a step further and basically use some stickers on a road sign. And by putting these stickers the way they did, the algorithms that are in charge of uh, orienting an autonomous car and reading the traffic and reading the road sign, suddenly the stop sign meaning was changed from a stop sign to a 40 miles per hour speed limit and the uh, road sign turning right became a stop sign. So at the moment where we are talking about introducing autonomous car, you see the kind of issue that that kind of experiment are actually uh, raising. So we just touched about two very concrete applications, but beyond that, what we are also talking in the international community, it's about the uh, weaponization of artificial intelligence, the so-called lethal autonomous weapon system. Anya will address this thing, but I just wanted to introduce you to the issue. This is a very uh, topical issue and an issue of really high concern because we are creating a technology that has potentially the seeds at one point to surpass human skills. And therefore, we have to be very careful in the way uh, we do it. So we are very fortunate tonight to have two uh, excellent uh, uh, guest speakers on this issue. One that is representing more uh, the private sector than civil society, with the World Economic Forum, and I are representing uh, intergovernmental uh, negotiation. And so we really look forward to your uh, presentation. David, David, uh, Nick, if you want to start? Sure. So maybe um, we could switch over to the next slide deck. Um, see how that goes. I guess I wanted to to say just really three or four key messages about the idea of the malicious use of AI. And I want to start by saying that it goes a lot to our conception of artificial intelligence in general. And the stories that we're currently telling about artificial intelligence and its uses matter as much as the actual underlying technology. Um, and that, that might be something that's a little bit controversial in some circles because people tend to think of the technology itself, the underlying capabilities of algorithms, data, and processing power that, that John Mark mentioned as being the sum total of the possibility space of use. But actually, the possibility space of how this is applied comes as much from how we collectively start to design, share, and embed artificial intelligence in the, the objects and the systems around us. Whether that be a, uh, um, the artificial intelligence which is completely and, and deeply embedded in, in the devices we carry around with us today, or the public uh, uses of artificial intelligence which are just beginning now um, but which are really making a large number of, of decisions for us as citizens uh, increasingly every day. And I put up this, these two images um, because the one on the right you may recognize as being a benevolent, uh, at least in the latest Iron Man uh, movie, a benevolent use of AI in the form of Tony Stark's uh, uh, suit. Um, but does anyone recognize the image on the left? I don't know where that comes from. Uh, isn't it one of the Greek vases on the Louvre? Exactly, so it's a piece from a, a, a vase which is depicting the character Talos. And Talos was an, uh, a robot created by Hephaestus, one of the Greek gods who was the iron forger, the bronze forger in Greek mythology. And he had one purpose, which was to be a lethal autonomous weapon. He was an automaton that, that protected the island of Crete from being invaded, and he circled it every, every day three times and threw rocks at invaders. And his, his starring act was in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, where he, he crushed uh, the, tried to crush the, 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 the Greek ships as they, they were trying to board and, and come onto the island of Crete. Um, I tell this story for two reasons. Firstly, um, we have been talking, imagining, creating stories, and trying to create um, automate and robots, artificially intelligent being with capacities that are both benevolent and lethal uh, and violent in many ways um, for, for, set for, for millennia. Um, the, the story of, of uh, Talos ends because uh, Medea, who was on the, the ship with Jason, found that the artificial intelligence had a key vulnerability, which was that if you removed one small piece of material from its leg, uh, it lost all its power uh, to move, it lost its, uh, its vital essence and stopped and they were able to then overcome the island. And 
I guess the, the, the one of the key framings in our, our, our sense of what, you, of what artificial intelligence is today is both this idea that we are creating so many systems for very positive benevolent, benevolent reasons although they can be used in multi-purposes and in a kind of dual use or multi-use multi uh, uh, settings and Anya will take, talk a lot more about that. But secondly, because artificial intelligence is, not, is, is made by us, is, is created in imperfect ways, because we are imperfect, we can't think of every, everything that could possibly happen, we are actually creating huge new vulnerabilities which can be exploited through the malicious use of AI. So when you come to this subject of the malicious use of AI, make sure to come at it from the perspective of, here's an AI system that could be used for multiple purposes by multiple people. And the flip side, which is, here is a set of AI systems which can be undermined to create uh, unfortunate, um, uh, unqu unfortunate outcomes. So again, just to make sure that, that as we talk about this, we don't leave whole sets of dynamics out. And our mental model of the problematic use of AI, not just malicious, you know, can be any of these or many more. The panopticon, the idea that AI is being used more and more to control us, uh, and I can tell you from the point of perspective of civil society, it's not just AI systems, but it's many other types of algorithms which are being used to control, attack, undermine uh, different activities in many countries around the world, both by government and non-government actors. Um, you have the, the traditional images from popular culture around the way that the Terminator can be both a, a good and a negative um, uh, view. The, the fact that we have stories about biotechnologies which are inherently based on artificial intelligence in the ability to code and sequence and understand genomes. Uh, it's a basic uh, function uh, of those systems. And of course, the image in the middle, which is a still from um, a recent Islamic State uh, video released on the use of drones uh, um, in, in Iraq. And I wanted to just kind of outline again these four big dynamics, which have been beautifully outlined in Miles Brundage's uh, report. Uh, if you Google the malicious use of AI, the top 50 results will be the report from the Future Humanity Institute at Oxford and, and Miles Brundage, about 20 co-authors. Um, this is a kind of a rethinking of some of his work uh, in that. Um, but the four things we really need to care about is how are existing threats being expanded by the use of artificial intelligence that lowers the costs and increases the accessibility for to do things and, and to give people powers that they didn't have before. Secondly, we are creating entirely new threats because AI systems are already exceeding human capabilities in specific narrow ways. So the, the, the simple example of this is the ability to control a swarm of flying vehicles is beyond the capacity of a human pilot. An entire swarm relies on uh, an AI to control the multiple um, interacting parts. Uh, as an attack vector, AI is, is critical to that. Same with autonomous cyber uh, weapons. The introduction of new vulnerabilities I mentioned, um, this is both the widespread reliance on AI systems and leveraging existing ones for mal malicious outcomes. An example of this is the Facebook and Cambridge Analytical controversy. Um, there is an existing set of AIs that can be tricked in a certain way to deliver political outcomes that people don't agree with, uh, perhaps due to a lack of understanding, perhaps due to, to poor design, etc. Um, and then finally, um, and this is something that Anya will touch on as well, we're changing the typical character of threats, uh, particularly in the, in the security space. And I'll mention here that there are three security spaces that we do care about when we often think about malicious youth use. One of them is the, the cyber space. So how is this being used for cyber attacks, cyber defense, to undermine the integrity of data, the privacy of data, um, uh, to change or deny access to underlying data that we use every day. There's also the physical space. So the hacking of a, of a drone or the use of a drone to, to create um, offensive capabilities. And finally, there's the political space, the, the way that, that we are being manipulated or the way that we could be manipulated. And it leads to a whole series of, of challenging questions about how we might start to look at the question of governance uh, here. Again, this is something that, that Anya is really the, the, the specialist in the intergovernmental arena, but someone you've also spent a lot, many time with, a lot of time with the private sector on these questions. And I guess if I, I kind of start to bring my brief remarks to a conclusion here. I'd say first of all, we have to think about and realize, uh, as I started at the beginning, that these technologies are, are not completely, they're not neutral tools. 
They're not things that we can just pick up and decide how we use them whenever we want to use them. The way that artificial intelligence systems, the way that nuclear systems, the way that our iPhones are designed, are commercialized, are marketed, are reinvented by us every day, uh, has a real impact on, on what we do them and, and, and how we use them. And so we cannot push the responsibility of governance either completely to the designers nor to the users and say if there were just fewer bad people in the world, we would be fine. If we just didn't have those pesky non-state actors who want to blow stuff up, um, everyone, would, everyone could have free access to AI. Actually, the way that we are designing these system in, systems in many ways creates vulnerabilities and invites uh, attack. And we have to think carefully about those kind of conversations, improving our ability to talk about these issues. The second thing is that the <coughs> biggest vulnerabilities that are exploited by artificial intelligence today and that are likely to be exploited are not technical vulnerabilities. They're not the sense that you launch a Stuxnet virus that is artificially intelligent and it worms its way in behind firewalls all over the world and, and, and locks everything up for Bitcoin. The most likely advanced use of artificial intelligence in the cyber attack world is on is spear phishing, is actually exploiting human vulnerabilities to get you to give up your password to gain access to systems. Human vulnerabilities in the political, physical and digital environments are where the rubber hits the road. And so when we think about governance, we're also thinking about human solutions, not just technical solutions. We're talking about retraining the way that we look at the world and we act, not just trying to design a better algorithm. And that's a much harder problem. The easy bit is designing the algorithm. The hard part is adjusting our behavior around that and rethinking how we want to, want to use it. And then I guess I'll finish by, by, by re reiterating this point that from the point of view of the private sector uh, and civil society, um, this stuff is already here. Uh, uh, the while recorded uses, like verified uses of, of AI cyber attacks in the wild are still patchy at the moment. Um, the fact is right now that the GSP, GSP, GCSP as an organization, just like the World Economic Forum, uh, is probably getting uh, uh, penetration attacks on its, on its systems between about 100 and 4,000 times a day. Um, certainly the World Economic Forum, we're getting, um, getting attacked every day by increasingly sophisticated tools. And uh, it's really important to realize that the people behind those tools have bigger organizational budgets than the entire budget of the World Economic Forum. Criminal organizations, state actors, and groups of non-state actors that are using or looking to use these things are not uh, lone 21-year-old uh, kind of white male hackers sitting in the corner with a hoodie up. Um, they are very sophisticated organizations with supply chains, well financed, with, um, with running experiments, sharing knowledge, um, and sharing resources in ways that make this uh, a, an organizational challenge as much as it is a, um, a technical, technological challenge. Um, and for when you talk about civil society in the private sector, figuring out how to protect small and medium sized enterprises, how to skill up and give capacities and help desk services in a changing threat environment to millions of, of activists around the world and, and activist organizations is something that we, we spend less time talking about than we do the similar challenges uh, on, the, on the government side or on the large multinational side. So I'll leave it there and, and kind of then allow Anya to tell us how we solve some of these problems with the kind of um, great uh, facilitation and governance that, that she has to do every day with, with her stakeholders. Anya? <laughs> you have a small task here. Five minutes, five minutes conversations. No, I just want to, I mean, one important point which, uh, which Nick just uh, made very eloquently is this offense defense thinking. It's way easier to be on the offense side than the defense side. All you need is one win. You need one entry point uh, and you're in. Whereas you're on the defensive side, you need to constantly prepare for unknown, unidentified threats with increasingly advanced technologies at the other end. And if you don't possess these same technologies, you are will be left behind. And that's, that's something that whether you are industry, you are civil society, you are an international organization, or, or you know, your military establishment is something that I know is on top of everyone's mind. Then it's very important to go from that and not then go overboard, where we recreate and generate so much of the threat scenario that we start responding to things that are not there, and in doing so, actually generate more threats. So it is it is a balance to be found with these issues. 
Um, going back a little bit and back to what you were saying, uh, Jean-Marc, initially, you know, from a security uh, perspective, which is sort of predominantly the area that I'm looking at, you know, there's no doubt that um, artificial artificial intelligence-based technologies, machine learning, sensor capabilities, abilities to scan through and analyze, you know, huge uh, amounts of data and create patterns is fundamentally changing uh, the international security landscape uh, alongside other new and emerging technologies. So it's not like AI is in isolation, but it's also AI is fundamentally a feature. That's an important thing to understand. It's a feature you add on to a system, add on to something else that helps us advance and scale something else. And that's very important when you start talking about you know more physical assets. You want to govern and control more physical assets if you have a physical asset that has been enhanced by this feature, how does that play into how you govern and regulate you know, this physical asset? Or are we talking about a feature in the virtual space? You know, you talked about cyber or even social manipulation. I would say it's a third space, is a fourth space to the three spaces, which is the social domain. And honestly, you know, when people ask what keeps me up at night, I'm more worried about what um, the high scale of what I would say that I call it the adoption maturity model. The technology itself is flatlining a little bit in terms of our ability to really go further. What is changing is the horizontal integration adoption of it. But the maturity model, our maturity model, our governance maturity model is not necessarily keeping up the same speed. So we're adopting at the scale, integrating at scale, without really thinking what the social impact, about the political impact, about the impact on security, uh, the security environment. And this is something I think we all need to take more time, take a pause, think about. Um, and you know, something that the Secretary General of the UN has been very, he calls it frontier technologies. And he spends a lot of time now around the world really trying to address, okay, what is the impact on us? The impact in this case on the UN, but also on member states. Does it address equality? Will it make equality, will we have improved equality or more equality? Who has access to it? You know, if data is sort of, you know, the, the new, Lever, you know, for, for power, you know, who has access to it? Data integrity was also mentioned. Who owns the data? How do we take ownership? The implementation of the GDPR in Europe, you know, 18th of May, you know, will, will be a very defining character on where the ownership question will lay. This also means how we use data to train some of the systems, which I will go into in a second. And also one thing, and I'm just going to pitch it here because it's something I feel very passionate about, mm -hmm. is the children's, the, the footprint of our children. Because we're creating realities, we are adopting its scale, but we are kind of leaving behind that there's a new generation of the highly digital, and there's a new generation that haven't even entered the digital space yet, but we made them digital. How are they being protected in all of this? So the security domain is wide. So it's not just you know the next weapon system, it's also how it is being used for good in terms of stabilizing forces, you know, to stabilize strategic you know, differences, uh, but also how it can be terribly destabilizing without us even noticing. So uh, from an arms control space, I mean, it's clear that these technologies pose you know, quite, you know, quite um, significant challenges to some of the thinking and the mindsets that have dominated uh, disarmament and arms control and non-proliferation thinking. But it also offers <coughs> opportunities. It's important not to lose sight of those positive applications. It could, it could help us tremendously with verification work and tracing work and detection work, you know, when you're looking at everything from Bio, uh, biological weapon systems, you know, to conventional systems, you know, chemical weapon systems, um, and also nuclear. Increasingly, we're going into that area. <clears throat> in the, if we can take up my um, slide, so they have the first, the first one there. So um, there is the very intricate name of the group of governmental experts on emerging technologies in the area of, and <clears throat> it should be actually reversed. Sorry, it was a mistake. There, it should be in the area, the emerging technology in the area of lethal autonomous weapon systems. And it's important to emphasize there that, you know, the, there's a discussion that has been going on at the UN now. Uh, it's on its fourth year. Uh, it's the, we just finished a second meeting, um, formal meeting, after three years of informal deliberations. And the real focus here is not the systems itself, but the emerging technologies that are underpinning the development of new types of weapon systems. Some of the core issues that's been discussed, as you will see on the NEAT um, list, it has gone from characterization to the human-machine interaction. What are the military applications, positive and negative? And what are the 
human security challenges, and then there's also a, a kind of a, a subcategory, which is like, what are some of the governance models that we could look at? Is it a code of conduct? Is it a political declaration? Is it a treaty? Is it something else? And member states, so the are high contracting parties of this particular body, as they're called, you know, are still deliberating exactly what, what kind of governance, governance of any, you know, would you put around, you know, these systems? What one important thing, and, and it's been a big evolution in thinking among member states as well, is the issue of human control and accountability. And what's important, and, and Nick made a reference to this, and we also spoke about you know, AlphaGo and, and you know, Liberatus that are these big game-changing technologies because they are able to optimize decision-making and also operate in an imperfect environment. And these are two very important segments if you think about putting in anything into a very imperfect battlefield at best. AI systems, you know, when you speak about autonomy, you will think that, you know, a fully autonomous system would require, uh, would, would be, would, ins would insinuate uh, a low degree of human control. Actually, that's not the case today. A highly autonomous system is actually quite a labor intensive process. It might actually require quite a few people being involved in these processes. A system with lower degree of autonomy, but an easier, the metrics are more straightforward, could actually then require much less of human control. So what that means is that it brings us back to the issue of accountability. And international law, and this is one of the consensus, or sort of was more or less a consensus, you know, in the body discussing this, is that international humanitarian law is the, is the principle to go by. And there should always be a level of human control and human accountability in the further application development and use of these systems. And those are two pretty big kind of convergences of uh, opinions around this issue that there is a human control element, there is the issue of human accountability, and there's the issue of, um, <coughs> and the, issue of, uh, of the, you know, the, de the degree of involvement that this requires in the different systems, and international humanitarian law at the core and the basis of all of this. So you may, some of you may come from the more security field or the military field, others may not. So if I just run through a couple of, you know, you may think like, okay, what are the military defense applications of AI? So, you know, you were mentioning some of the usages, you know, in, in the social sphere or the manipulation sphere, but, you know, it can be everything from algorithmic target recognition, uh, it could be used in war gaming, in preparations of, you know, of, of uh, an intervention. It could be used, as, as Nick was referring to, more in the offensive defensive you know, capabilities. Uh, it could also be offensive defensive kinetic systems, so the physical interaction, uh, computational military reasoning, which is very important you know, in very intricate environments, goes with liberatus, right, you know, to use this for decision-making processes. Tactical applications, you know, where you're looking at detection. Um, and mission handoffs, you know, where you're trying to uh, you know, basically um, even, I mean, sort of to, to ease the handoff between machine and humans or humans and machines, you know, in, in, in a dynamic environment. Let me uh, go to, so one of the interesting, um, if I go to, I'm just going to change my slide as well so I can, don't have to turn around, I can look at you. So, as I was mentioning, so when you look at the first slide, when you go all the way to the top, you know, you have, and the report, the chair summary, which is an informal report purely prepared by the chair to help member states to go back to their capital, capitals and prepare continued deliberations on the topic, is available on our website. So it's very easy to find and you get much deeper insight in what was discussed and what was the big issues. I really recommend, if you have an interest in this issue, to read a report or read it for what it is. It's an informal account of what was discussed and a discussion that will continue at much greater depth uh, in August. <clears throat> One of the uh, sort of when we were discussing, I was talking about the human machine interaction, and I was mentioning you know, high degree of autonomous systems may require a really high level of uh, human involvement, and then the other way around, you know, so there's no automaticity, automaticity in this, is also to understand what are the human machine touch points in the context of these new systems and the underlying technologies. And so we created this, it, it ended up actually being called Sunrise Chart. Uh, we went through many iterations of the name. And it's not meant as being authoritative guidance or anything. It was purely meant as a tool to think with because so much of the discussion, and this goes back to, you know, to uh, Nick's point on you know, referring back to old Greek history, you find exactly the same in old Indian history. 
you know, where you speak about old Indian gods and how they actually had autonomous systems, but they saw them as so powerful that only gods can actually make the decision, not the humans. And so now we've taken that power into our own hands and we have to, you know, to, to, to manage that well was to challenge a little bit of the way we approach it because we tend to come at it from the latter end. You know, it's all developed, it's ready to use, and now how do we inter interact with it? So what this chart is meant to do is saying that these are the various, this is like the, the life cycle of a system, if you may. And there are human machine touch points in every piece of these life cycle. When you're working with system design, you realize that a lot of what you are able to do in number four, and you use in a board, actually depends on if you got the one and the two right. And a lot of the challenge related to any form of A applications, when you talk about you know, autonomous cars, you talk about using facial recognition to detect your, uh, your, your consumer behavior in a supermarket to make sure that you stock the right products, it's the same thing, if you don't get the initial metrics and design right, and you design it to what it's meant to use, you have the data, uh, the data that, that you need to design it well and to train it well, you get the codes and the, you know, the, the, the parameters uh, of the code or the algorithm right, you know, you're really going to struggle in the deployment side. So this was a way of illustrating that there are many touch points and we need to focus on these in parallel and not just at the latter end where you're thinking about, okay, it's being deployed, how now do we stop it? Uh, you were mentioning Google earlier, the same team that was working on the Go also produced uh, about a year ago, I guess now, or two years ago, this paper around a, called it a red button. Is there a red button, like a stop button, you know, for A applications? And what they found is that yes, it is a red button for certain types of algorithms. And especially if you know the whole, if I can call it a value chain of the creation of that algorithm but it's not something that you can apply across the board. It doesn't apply automatically to any process. And in a lot of these developments, be it systems or whatever you do, you purchase different technologies and different things from different places, right? As I said, it's a feature. So you may very well build a physical system, but then you purchase, for, you know, for governments, you purchase the actual system or the feature from a commercial company, because you may not have the company or the technological prowess or the know-how to build these features. So now, do you know the whole value chain you know, it's like when you buy apples at Coop, right, at co-op, you know, you can trace it back to, you know, what farm it came from. You know, is that what we need, you know, also for these applications to make sure that we can reverse engineer and find the origin of it and also then test its authenticity. This goes into two, the testing and evaluation, evaluation the verification and validation, and the reviews. Because the review process, which is set up in the Geneva Protocol 1, uh, also requires you to be able to account for that entire value chain. Now, how that is being interpreted is still up for debate, and it's definitely something that will be tested by these technologies, but this was something that member states, in the deliberations just a couple of weeks ago, were really diving into, and most likely one of the issues that will go deeper into when they, when they uh, resume again the discussions in August. <clears throat> then, just a few takeaways, you know, just to kind of help you know, people. So, these were, you know, the takeaways, like the main takeaways, which I just talked about, the consensus on maintaining human control over critical functions and the use of lethal force and laws, you know, so international law stays, you know, at the basis. Um, distinction, proportionality, decision-making are crucial aspects to deployment of current and future weapon systems. This goes back to the Sunrise chart I said, you've got to have an overview of the whole human <coughs> touch. Uh, sort of the human machine touch point, you know, system when you think about how do you actually interact with the systems. Um, emphasis, and this was something that's been reiterated again and again, technological literacy. Actually understanding, even at the basics, you don't have to understand how you create the systems, but try to really understand the applications and the impact. How can it be applied? How does it impact them? When I went to the ballot box the last time, did I check? You know, did I actually do some due diligence in checking how my behaviors were being, you know, uh, being, being mapped and maybe used or manipulated? You know, this is something we've all been thinking after revelations, you know, in recent months about how our data has been used even in these earlier, you know, kind of, we felt bulletproof, you know, uh, um, democratic processes, which, which turned out was not the case anymore. This is, not, this is more talking about the social aspect of it, not the military aspect of it. But it's important also in these deliberations that, you, that decisions are informed, that they understand the technology, so we're not ending up regulating or looking at or governing the wrong aspect or the wrong end of, of the spectrum of what we're trying to address. Then the last thing, you know, the consideration of appropriate governance and oversight instruments. 
And this is, I don't have the answers, but I, I can tell that, you know, member states are very committed in looking into what are those. And it's, it's a wide specter of, of, you know, options out there. Um, uh, but the important thing is to really emphasize that there is a, there's a strong engagement. Um, and I see there's a couple of people here from, from member states, you know, that were part of these deliberations. I think they all can speak up, you know, to say that um, it was it was five intense days of deliberations and a level of engagement from from states that it, that was uh, that you know has been building up over years, but was definitely felt this time that people really invest in trying to understand and also think ahead. And then the if we go down to the bottom thing, just going back more to the broader spectrum. So this is just a. Uh, this is actually created, so I don't have the, the, the copyright on this one, but it's, so this is created by ITU and XPRIZE in preparations for the ITU AI for Good uh, Global Summit that took place in 2017. Uh, there will be another one, AI for Good Summit, uh, actually being organized uh, 15 to the 17th of May, where they will continue the deliberations. And basically what this is like is taking this, the sustainable development goals which is this brilliant framework of integrating, of actually doing that silo busting, which is so needed, integrating that into and saying, okay, what are we doing with this? And for every single one here, you will see the outer, the outer layer, which is created by XPRIZE, are some of the positive applications of AI to the sustainable development goals. But each one, of course, has to be complemented of thinking about equality, access, data integrity, all of these other things, but it helps us to go that length. Goal nine is uh, industrial growth and innovation. How do we make sure that innovation is responsible? How do we make sure that it happens in such a way that you can also preserve some of these other things that Shamak and, and Nick and, and I also have touched upon? I will leave it there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Anya <coughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and Nick. Let me just skip the last one. So, as you see, this is a very uh, comprehensive issue that raises a lot of, uh, of problems. And uh, what you highlighted, uh, Nick is that we are actually creating important vulnerability to patch current vulnerabilities. And we can see that, for instance, with the IoT, Internet of, of Things. The way we'll deal with that is by developing AI to patch the vulnerabilities. But then what do you do with the new vulnerabilities that you, that, that you create? And uh, there is the issue of uh, the value chain, as, as you mentioned, the stakeholders, is very important. And um, the, the key, I think, is what you just mentioned, Anya, responsible innovation. You know, we have to infuse values that uh, when you develop that kind of system, it's not like you would manufacture a car or um, what we had during the, uh, the industrial revolution. So my question to both of you is that each of your organization has started to deal with this issue a few years ago, uh, the UN for the UNCCW uh, conference. Mm -hmm. What has been the biggest challenge that you have been uh, encountered and uh, what needs to be done to bridge uh, the gap between a intergovernmental approach and more uh, an approach based on the private sector. Similar for, for, for you, Nick, I think you introduced AI, I think, two years ago in, uh, in Davos, in the forum. So what has been the biggest challenge that, you, that you've seen uh, with your stakeholders and how can you try to overcome these two? And then I open the floor for, uh, for questions. Well, I, I, kind of, I spend a little bit of time on both sides of the question because we do work a lot on the, the governance of emerging technologies and the biggest challenge on that side is actually the fact that the technical community which are working on both the creation of the actual technologies and the creation of standards around those technologies uh, talk a completely different language to the policy community. Um, and in fact, it is fascinating to sit in the room when they attempt to talk to one another uh, and uh, the, it's not just that they don't understand each other, it's, it's that you've got two groups of people that seem to actively offend one another uh, at, at various points in time. Um, and so one of the areas where we're trying to work right now is, is on the facilitation, on the very human challenge of just how do you improve the productivity of conversations? How do you get the right people in the room rather than sitting in different levels? Um, uh, of the same building, um, uh, and secondly, what, what kind of a conversation do you need to bring together? Which all goes to this point of, we spend a lot of time in governance discussions trying to nut out the what of governance. So what's the content we need to solve this problem? And we spend less time 
uh, unfortunately doing what Anya's doing, which is reinventing the how of governance. So rethinking how we actually have these deliberations and what kind of new information we need to, to respond in a flexible way to a changing threat landscape, not just a changing threat landscape, to grasping the opportunities that are the primary reason we're developing um, many of these, these algorithms. So I think that's, the, that's the, the, the biggest thing for me on the governance side and, and um, these discussions. On the very practical how we implement AI technologies in our own organization and, and what we're experimenting with, um, is that there is this view that uh, let's just start experimenting and then talk, talk about the potential consequences later. It's so exciting. We want to roll this out with HR. We want to roll this out with um, uh, live transcription. We want to think about this as an opportunity to, to test different things. It is really fantastic. Um, but we, as an organization, continually catch ourselves and say, okay, um, we know that we, we've written a report recently on, on bias and discrimination in machine learning. Where might be, we need to be aware of those things in our, our systems? Uh, and it's actually a very tough a task to find that time, to create that time, uh, and to have a structured conversation because we're not, we're not used to doing it which, at the level which Andy was saying, which addresses the technical aspects as well as the social aspects. Um, this, is, you know, this is capacity building and training that, that, that all organizations need. And at the heart of the, the Australian government discussion uh, that I'm involved in at the moment with the Australian Human Rights Ca uh, Commission on the, uh, the governance of artificial intelligence is the suggestion of how do we, do, how do we build capacity at the Australian <coughs> national level for different organisations who are deploying this, uh, this technology. Because this is not, um, it's not, as they say, it's not, it's not uh, rocket science necessarily, but it's got a lot to do with rocket science. So you've got to try and, try and uh, bring these things together. Thank you. So Nick and I used to work together, and I think we both uh, started adopting this new title. We had fancy titles on our cards, but and we ended up just saying we're professional translators. Yeah. Because that's a lot of times what you do in these conversations. And I think a, a breakthrough moment where this is now four or five years ago when we had the first, because we started a long time ago, the first discussions about the convergence between what was happening in the security space and the technology space. And we brought together uh, you know, a bunch of people just from all ends of the spectrum, human rights to robotics to material science, you know, the best brains of every single discipline you can, you can think of into one room. And I think both of us are thinking, you know, this, is, you know, this happens all the time, and especially with the organization that we were working for, only to realize that they never met. And of course they met because, you know, I mean, it has been said World Economic Forum, you know, like we, they do travel people around, so they had met around, you know, the bar or the coffee stand or whatever, but they never met and had that completely interdisciplinary discussion of being open to the fact that their stuff was connected to something else that may go way beyond something they had uh, thought about. And this is a real challenge. And it's a challenge because these things doesn't happen enough. We are still way too siloed. Uh, we are not, we may promote in what we say the interdisciplinary dialogue, we actually don't create the right platforms for it. But it's also an issue of empowerment. So that kind of negative talk back is also, you know, when you're coming from a certain field, you know, I've been doing what I've been doing, you know, for the last 30 years, it worked just fine for me, and who you are, you know, who are you to come and tell me that, you know, I don't know what's best or how to do this or how to regulate it or how to think about this. And so a lot of it's, you know, to have this educational awareness models that actually empowers people also to say, I don't understand this. I don't know how this will impact on me. I need to take a pause here because what you are outlining to me that, and this is like classical uh, commercial companies, buzzword stuff, what you're telling me, I will integrate this into my company or my organization, it would unlock digital value off and an absorbent amount, you know, that is difficult to turn down. You need to have that empowerment to saying, hold on one second, do I have the right setup? Do I have the right people? Do I have the right skill sets? And this is difficult to build. The other thing I see which is a big challenge is the issue around uh, uh, the intergenerational part. That, you know, we, I was in this great uh, conversation actually around, you know, the nuclear issue with these various youth groups and this uh, very, um, very well-spoken woman whose name I forget, I should honor her here, uh, from Canada, 30-year-old youth representative in the Canadian government said, I'm so sick and tired of the generation before us who's saying that we are you know, the youth generation is coming. We are here, you know, and we are living those realities that you guys are messing around and sort of, you know, worrying about, so why not involve us? And this is a very good point uh, in, in any discussion, like how do you bridge those 
generational gaps, you know, to actually have a meaningful dialogue because we are creating patterns <coughs> and policies that will impact us deeply, but even more so those who come, you know, who are already here, but who will follow into those decision-making positions right after us. And then there's two things which is more on a, on a personal level, and this is not UN, you know, it's very important to be cautious and you see this Sophia the robot and everything else. There's a real danger of this tech anthropomorphizing. You know, that we are, we are making, we are not being alert enough, you know, to the fact that these are what they are. These are machines, these are technologies, these are features, these are enhancers. So to show a little bit of cautionary approach on, you know, when we discuss these things and actually think about the pronouns that you use when you're thinking about these issues, you know, to be able to have that, to empower yourself to enter into discussions differently. And the other one, you know, goes back to the, uh, to the uh, awareness which is what I, is the, you know, it's the tech optimism, and then there is tech pessimism, and none of them are very helpful. But then it's the worst part in the middle, which is the tech naivete. So how to be optimism, integrate the risk thinking, you know, to actually have a clear kind of risk perspective to help you make informed decisions and engage in these debates, you know, for yourself and on behalf of others is a real challenge, and that's sort of, so that's aside from the bigger governance discussion itself, but more about how do you empower people to be part of those discussions? Uh, and how do you empower the younger generation to actually take part of this? Uh, just one sort of final note, and I, I have attributed this to him several times, the head of the IPU, the Interparliamentarian Union here in Geneva, which is a very impressive organization that actually goes back before the UN. Um, and I was moderating a debate some years ago, um, and the topic of the debate was what keeps you up at night? And his answer still kind of resonated with me. He said, he said the absolute reluctance of the ruling generation to allow the new, those to be ruled into the conversation on these issues. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's something really to, and this is something that he then invested a lot of his time and energy into to try to change that. Uh, but I think we, we will need to have a real collective movement in making sure that we empower and democratize also the forums and platforms where these things are being discussed. And this is why the SDG um, summit around artificial intelligence is very important because that's exactly the aim of it. How do you bring in all the UN organizations that among them, amongst them are supporting people all over the world. And for those who are Geneva based, you would have seen a lot of the talk about international Geneva and how those organizations, if you go, it's like the iceberg methodology that you only see what may be wrong at the highest political level but there's not enough focus about every single element of it. The UN is involved in anything from industrial standards to labor standards to design standards, uh, you know, to, to more nitty-gritty stuff that touches on everyone's life, you know, every single day. But how you democratize access into the discussion, then how AI will be, you know, a transformative agent for for good, but for better, and also the risks of it, you know, it is very important. Sorry, that was a long-winded activist answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's open the floor for our discussion. I think we... Well, <laughs> lots of questions. Excellent. I saw the first hand uh, was raised, was the top on the, at the front. Can you just bring the, the mic over there? Thank you. It's coming on your side. Can you just introduce yourself? So I'm Paul Ingram from the British American Security Information Council, and I'm here for the NPT PREPCOM, <coughs> Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, Nuclear Weapons, Dinosaur Technologies, uh, technologies that we're trying to control the legacy of, and I'm really excited to be here tonight, because this is clearly looking at the, 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 the present, let's put it that way, rather than the past. I wanted to say that um, I look with both excitement and with a huge amount of fear. And there are two issues here for me. One is control, and the other is letting go. Uh, two sides of the spectrum, I guess. And um, I guess my, my, my principal question is, uh, when these technologies give such advantage to organizations, groups of individuals, individuals themselves, to pay no attention to some of the ethics that you're describing. 
uh, when it, it, it benefits militarily uh, a non-state actor to pay no attention at all to having human intervention before there is some lethal use of this technology because of speed of reaction and any number of other advantages. How do you get these technologies uh, developed and used in ways that meet the guidance that you're trying to develop? I'm sure you're asked this question all the time, but it's very difficult for me to understand how you get from the point of getting agreement, even among states who find it difficult to trust each other, when this technology, unlike nuclear weapons, is is accessible or you know, way beyond the states that are trying to control it. Right, we'll take a few questions because there are lots of questions. Uh, so we'll take a few. Uh, if you could be as brief as possible, so that we have, we can cover as much as possible. So we start by on, on that side, and then we'll move to the other side of uh, the room. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm Ronald Barnes from Indigenous Peoples and Nations Coalition from Alaska. You're speaking down to the mic, yes? Oh, there it is. It's no, it's, it's working, but just. It is working. Okay. Um, my question is, you know, I, I, do you have examples, because you showed photos that were faked. What about videos? How fast is the technology? When you see someone five, ten years ago who has done an interview, and you look at it, and you see something else said, is there some technology to make it look even the facial, uh, reaction or the physical attributes changing with the words that were spoken. Is there something like that happening? In the a, a, short, a short answer, this technology already exists. So this is already out there. You can, you can Google, for instance, President Obama. Uh, you have a video where uh, they did the 14 hours of um, analysis of the movement of his mouth uh, was enough to train an algorithm to be able to replicate his movements and put a total, uh, his own discourse, or Nix uh, or Anya could have uh, delivered this talk and you would have seen President Obama behind the White House, uh, the, the desk of the White House talking to him. This is already already there. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's already passed it. Yes. <laughs> Both face and voice. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah the common uh, representing the German Ministry of Defense. <coughs> Uh, Martin Grunfeld, uh, some of the go at the same place where you're sitting now, explained to us that the only disruptive te technology in arms he, he saw so far was nuclear weapon. Uh, because they are cutting the tie between winning a war and survival. Uh, and he also explained that he does not believe that in the foreseeable future, artificial intelligence will have the same effect. I would, have, I would like to see uh, or to listen to your views on that. Thank you very much. Can we start with this round of questions? And then we move to the second one. Who wants to take? Yeah, I, I guess um, to take the second question first and then go back to there. Um, I, I agree. Um, nuclear weapons are in a different category because of the immediate scale that they can, uh, of, of destruction that we've seen. And we have, um, if, if, if nuclear weapons had the same efficiency and scalability that we're seeing of purely digital uh, forms of algorithms today, we would probably be in a lot different uh, situation existentially than, than we are uh, today with the good work of NPT and, and, and ANYA and others. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry about it as it changes a different set of threat landscapes. Uh, it also increases the vulnerability uh, because for, for citizen groups in new ways as well. Because the, 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 the prime issue of, of using artificial intelligence for targeting uh, is that it's not just targeting individuals. It's not looking for, you know, just for a single face or a single piece of intelligence to then um, uh, make a, a decision to, to fire or not fire. It's also using demographic identifying uh, information. Um, which leads into a whole different set of, um, of ethical questions with the, the use of force and the use of intelligence to, to, to make decisions in a security sense. Um, so I agree with you, but at the same time, I think that there are um, emerging threats and vulnerabilities here which behoove us to, to look at as they change the, 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 the strategic landscape. Um, and to, to go back to, you know, what do we do? 
I think one of the things we have to look at is we have to question the openness by which <coughs> we are developing and sharing cutting edge algorithms today. Um, it's a very contentious issue within the AI community, um, but you may be aware that um, the reason why the field is moving very quickly is because of the willingness of AI researchers to publish white papers which include uh, very technical details and often indeed the source code of their breakthroughs. Um, and so that does lead to the kind of story that, that John Mark told where within a few months you get someone creating an online, online application <coughs> using a, a kind of a months old algorithm that anyone can use. Um, there have been suggestions recently in the community, in the AI community, um, that certain uh, breakthroughs in AI should be restricted to smaller groups of researchers. It would not prevent them being used by state actors, but it may prevent uh, uh, kind of the edge cases of people just running off and trying stuff. Uh, it also may support the building into the code of safeguards, which Anya also uh, mentioned. And that's the, the, one of the key issues in AI research today is if you start at the beginning when you're designing the code, if you're thinking about the type of training and data sets that go into it from day one, you can have a, a, a much better sense of control and flow through. You can also track their use much better. Um, so if you understand and, and you build that in, that does um, uh, uh, give some traceability and accountability to the use of algorithms. Um, but we're not currently doing that because uh, it's, the, it's still the Wild West at the moment. So bringing that back would be, uh, again, I said it's contentious, and for those AI researchers in the room who are seething and boiling um, or who are watching online, um, mm -hmm. this is just this is actually one of, um, uh, of, of Niles' suggestions in, in the report. Yeah, I think the control letting go question is a, is a, it's, you know, is a important one, and there's, there's no simple answers to it. You know, what we do know is that governments will, they're now finding a way on how to do the development, the testing, the validation, the deployment, you know, all of, you know, what we looked at when I was showing you the Sunrise chart. Whereas, of course, if you're not bound by any of those, you know, you can have an 80% one or something that is not compliant with anything of rules and still deploy it and not really. I mean, if your if your target is maximum disruption and destabilizing, uh, you know, impact, that might actually behoove you, you know, to have something. So, it is a very difficult. Uh, it's a very difficult. There's no clear answers to it, and we can't prevent from it as well. And and what Nick was referring to, you know, this open source crowdsourcing uh, platforms have brought tremendous uh, benefits, you know, to the overall. Uh, research community, but you know it also has this other side, you know, which is that demo it democratizes, you know, access to potentially very disruptive technologies. I mean, if any of you have done any coding camps lately, and you know, especially if you, there's nothing uh, better than you know, kind of reminding yourself or, or learning, relearning to be humble, uh, which I just recently did when you know the 12 year old in my coding class was upgraded to the next level, and I was too bad to sort of you know so have to stay behind. But when you work with, for example, very uh, you know good hackers, and how you can now, without knowing a line of code, you can basically merge three open source codes together, and with the right understanding of your targets, if you come from the arms control space and the empathy space, you presumably know a lot about you know what you are working on, and you are like the worst kind of designer, right? Because you know what the vulnerabilities are. And all you need to do is purchase the rest of it. And you can do that fairly easily online and, and you know, without much uh, fear of being traced also. And this is a very, uh, on a personal level, uh, a trend that I think all of us who are following these issues closely are very worried about. Now, is there a way to stop that, govern it, prevent it? I don't, I'm not so sure. I think it's, this is where we need to have that collective movement of, of greater awareness. Uh, right uh, on the, on the, uh, the <coughs> What was the last? The, the nuclear, exactly, the, the, the nuclear mm -hmm. issue. What I said initially, that these are features, right? And in any, when you speak about the arms control space at all, you know, like it's not just the AI based technologies, right? It is what the advances that we're having in material sciences, in robotics, in, uh, you know, delivery systems, in aeronautics. It is so many fields that kind of converge into, especially when you talk about physical systems. And so AI is a feature that you know, could, you know, you can look at it as a, a kind of category of things of itself, or you can also look at it as a game changer for existing regimes. And it need to be both, and somebody was saying to me, because Rand, uh, the, the think tank in the US, came out with a report about a week ago called, uh, I think the, artic the, name, the name of the article was how AI increases the chance of a nuclear war. 
to me personally, when I start, when you start having headlines, and even though these are headlines, and when Rand publishes, you can say it's becoming quite mainstream, you know, knowledge that these, these things come together. But when you have like cyber, AI, and nuclear in one sentence, <laughs> that's certainly me sit on the edge of my chair and sort of like looking carefully at what is being published. I mean, these are, these are real issues, but these are also ways of, you know, optimizing how we do things in a nuclear facility. It might help to reduce cost. Uh, it might help increase computational powers to run energy systems or water cooling systems, uh, other forms of operations. So it's not, you know, these features are, there's as many benefits and then there are some clear risks and we kind of need to have both thoughts in our head at the same time. But, um, but yes, when you see headlines like that, you, you, do, uh, you do kind of wake up a little bit. Can I just add one more thing sure. just on that, which is taking on the opportunity space, which we haven't really talked about enough tonight. Um, uh, because there are some breakthroughs in tracking malware and in some security and others where, where we, we're seeing some great stuff. But you know, everyone talks about AlphaGo and the breakthrough of, of beating the world's second best and the best um, Go player in the world. The same algorithm was used to uh, save 40% on the cooling costs of Google's uh, data centers around the world, a recurring benefit of around 150 to 200 million uh, US a year, recurring benefit every year, which is of course going up as they increase their data center usage. That's far more impressive uh, than beating someone at Go to be able to save 40% uh, on your cooling bill, 15% 15, 15 overall energy bill. And now they're talking to the UK's national grid about reducing UK's national energy consumption by 10% just through an optimization algorithm that was originally developed to play the board game. Um, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. Let's not then use it to kill people, maybe, but it's pretty cool. Right, and the, I think on the, just on the, the, the news debate, uh, I think what is this reference to is the scalability. The ability to create, uh, you were talking about drones, that you might have seen this picture of the, the Chinese uh, that use drones to do uh, a ballet, kind of air ballet. Um, and this has potential implications in the military field in the, in the sense that we can use swarming tactics. And this is disrupting in the military because so far there has been only a few instances of the use of swarms in the military sphere. The first manifestation of swarm are uh, DDoS attack, uh, denial, uh, distribution behind uh, DDoS services. services. Basically, you take uh, you hijack computers mm -hmm. and you give an instruction, and they will attack. Uh, they will overload the uh, server. And when we have, when we merge this uh, technology with physical uh, instrument weapons that have a payload, then we might reach a, uh, a level that we, we haven't seen. And uh, in terms of destruction, we might reach the same kind of uh, destruction that we've seen uh, with nuclear weapons. I'll go for the second round of questions. I saw a few hands that were raised. Yes. Uh, hi, Tim Reed, I'm a fellow here at GCSD. Uh, just going from what you've been saying so far, uh, then, you know, you look at in uh, health, right? You have, uh, say, or now we have this right to be forgotten. Also in health, you have warning labels on medication saying it could have these side effects. We have labeling saying this is organic. Why is there not a movement in order to, you know, governance for, for uh, you know, artificial intelligence so that people can take their fate more in their hands and say, this product contains AI, it is potentially subject to these vulnerabilities, so then maybe I don't buy the smart fridge, I buy the dumb fridge, maybe I can't control it while I'm on vacation, but at least I know that someone isn't hacking into my home through some vulnerability. <coughs> I think we just have a new startup going on. <laughs> <laughs> Cyber hygiene. Right. No, dumb devices. It's dumb devices, yes. Well, my name is Eric. I'm also a GCSP executive in residence. And I have a former career with the International Committee of the, of the Red Cross. So first, thank you for the uh, professional translation of AI. I appreciate that uh, very much. So I would like to come back on the points that uh, you mentioned. Of course, I'm delighted to hear that the international humanitarian law is the basis where we have to build. But we know very well that, unfortunately, the strength of international humanitarian law is its own weaknesses through the Article 1. You should respect and shall respect. It all goes down to political will at the end of the day. See Syria, see Yemen. So how do you intend to really have key 
on AI used for autonomous digital weapons based on very important solid instrument, but instruments that have no uh, compliance uh, mechanism, or the compliance mechanism are not used because it all water down to a political will. Last question, maybe? Thank you, uh, thank you, moderator, uh, Amir Ruan from Nepal, and thank you for uh, your excellent uh, presentations, for your insightful presentation about AI. I have a little different perspective, you know. Uh, every day we spend around $3.5 billion for security for both. You know, but uh, you know, if we go to uh, use artificial intelligence, maybe the cost will be go down. But today, uh, the damage of death, you know, people die from uh, diabetes more than this global war or something. Single year, in 2000, 1.2 million people die from diabetes. Today, sugar is most dangerous than gunpowder. So, this artificial intelligence should be directed to health, agriculture, and trade, you know, in 2015, there is $25 trillion global trade in e-commerce. So, we, we think about the positive side of artificial intelligence and that uh, we should come for it, it come under the people concern, <coughs> otherwise it should harm the global orders. So, uh, my perspective is, uh, because uh, we, we talk on the security perspective, we have to discuss, but we may be lack. We should uh, inclusively we should be discuss about artificial intelligence. And one more point, you know, today uh, the global scenario because half of the population they are out of internet. They don't know about artificial intelligence. So we we, we try to raise this uh, filling the gap of digital divide and physical divide in the global area. This is the most important issue because even my country. We have 60% internet access penetration, but 40% people they are out of internet and then they don't know about the AI. So in the Google Forum, we should raise this inclusive development for all people. And uh, you know, this, uh, today this another challenge uh, in AI, this is my personal perspective. Today, you know, Apple, they have 900 billion, they have uh, they are one revenue per year, 900 billion. But some countries, because this is more than many countries, give it And even Alibaba, they spend uh, 50 billion dollars per year R&D. So, because they are in the control of few. So, what is your last question? So, because we should uh, discuss about inclusive, way, not only safety perspective. Uh, so AI should, uh, uh, this discussion should go uh, other area, you know, like health issue, uh, like agriculture, like trade. But I got your point. Just uh, to, 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 to address this one, uh, the purpose of this panel world is we're not denying the benefits that AI will provide. And this is uh, the topic of the AI for Good meeting in two weeks at the IBITU. Uh, the purpose of this panel is to show that although this technology could have potential huge benefits, for uh, human uh, uh, civilization, there might be a possibility that this technology might go out of control. And therefore, the purpose of this panel is to, uh, to address this issue, but how can we prevent that from happening through governance? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Anya and Nick, you want to address to the questions? Uh, so first, you know, the, like I said, you know, the dog devices, you know, should it be an ingredient? Maybe, maybe that's, you know, the same thing with medical research, right? You know, you have to really, you have to have a proof of concept that what you are researching is not going to kill all your test patients. Um, I don't have the answer to this, you know, but I think you are on to, uh, to right. I mean, I can tell you for sure that I do not own any of the commercial devices on the market right now that interact with you in your home. Um, and, uh, and this is just purely a personal preference of not having myself you know, mapped out and the data. But you know, there's, uh, but then there's also convenience. 
I mean, I was recently, you know, I'm not going to go into commercials here, you know, but the company that provides, you know, the, the, the taxi company that you can download on your phone. <laughs> and, uh, and I was using them, and then this driver picks me up. Uh, actually, when I was still with the ICRC, I was working late, and uh, he picked me up and he said, oh, I picked you up, madam, because you have very good reviews. And I looked at him and was like, I have reviews? <laughs> not realizing that they were actually reviewing their passengers. So I had my marks up, markups as well. And so of course I go like, oh, you know, I feel you know, you know, infringed upon, etc. I'm never going to use you again. I didn't say to him, of course, you know, but I just like deleted it from my... Two months later, I'm standing downtown Geneva. It was again late. It was raining. Couldn't find a taxi. And what do I do? I download again. I download again. Because convenience take precedence. And that's kind of the community that we live in, right? You know, so will I get that smart fridge that tells me that I'm out of my kale for my juice the next morning, you know, uh, if I feel like in a healthy mode. I don't know yet, but it is kind of scary that we don't always take that pause and think about it and think how all of these things, you know, co you know, kind of communicate and aggregate and, and, and generate, right? And so it is a very important point that you're making. Then on the, let me just uh, stop to the, um, uh, go to the, uh, the issue of, uh, what was it the second? No, the second. So the I shall, you know, I don't have, I mean, I'm, I'm a bureaucrat, right? So I try to enable and facilitate and support. Uh, this is very much in the hands of the member states. But, you know, you will be happy to hear that ICRC, and they also got a lot of, uh, a lot of praise for this, you know, during the last meeting of member states, that they have played an instrumental <coughs> role in trying to really put on the table some of the key issues of international humanitarian law and also where the weaknesses are, but constantly honing in on the point that these are not, international humanitarian law cannot be questionable. You know, it is a, it's a fundament, you know, in what we do and then you have to work around it if that means that we have to change certain practices and how we report and review and these things, well, let's have that discussion. Uh, so the ICRC have played a very important role. Uh, then on the Nepal issue, and. Two, just two very quick points of this. First, I really recommend everyone, this is a bit of a commercial, uh, to read, go to Time Magazine and read Isumi Nakamitsu, who is the high representative for disarmament, uh, article which is actually making the case, you know, where, why we need to re look again at defense expenditures um, and the SDGs. You know, so she's making the argument that we are maybe going too far in the defense expenditure and not actually thinking about how preserving and supporting and implementing the sustainable development goals in the big scale of things might actually have a higher yield in terms of impact than expanding on the military, uh, than expanding military expenditure expenditures. It's a very good article, so I really recommend uh, all of you to read it. And then the last point, you know, you know, you were saying, you know, how we need to divert. And I did speak initially about quality and access and these things, and saying that the security drivers of insecurity is not just, you know, military expenditure or defense um, R and D. You know, it's so much more. It is all those things that you mentioned. It's also about getting that last billion or the people in your country that don't have access to internet online. But as all of them are going to be leapfrogging, how do we also give them the protection that they need? You know, how do they control the data? We have seen places where they have leapfrogged onto technologies, and technologies is actually becoming one of the biggest threats to their democratic, you know, new hard-won democratic models, you know, also in, in not, you know, close to your region, and close to your country. Um, <clears throat> so those things are real. And it's also important to remember that when you look at the big the investment scales globally, the R&D in defense applications is very, very low compared to the commercial investments in the same type of applications. And uh, Mary Cummings from Duke University has a paper out with Chatham House, which actually has these very uh, interesting slides and, and graphs that actually shows the, the scale over many years and also the current, what goes in from government-sponsored R&D into these applications and what gets invested from the commercial side into these applications. And it tells you a picture that we are a little bit beyond just saying, let's have governments, you know, refocus back on the kind of core development needs, but there needs to be a much uh, greater alignment of that, of, you know, of that movement. We can't deny the fact that if we just talk about AI-based technologies, these are not just important for, we talked about nuclear stabilization for the military defense side. These are core to countries' industrial, national, and economic competitiveness. Um, and the industry is a big uh, is a big part of that. Um, so, so that was my my final comment. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, just quickly. Um, 
labeling of um, AI, uh, it's, it's starting to be discussed. So there are two projects that I know of, one through the Petrus Research Consortium on Internet of Things, uh, looking to create some at least initial discussions on how you would go around certifying and labeling for IoT security, but also privacy, autonomy, agency. Uh, and then on the World Economic Forum side, we actually have a project looking at children's toys in this sphere. So looking at trying to drive better discussion around what you would accept for your children and also what you would accept for your aging parents, uh, given that, that uh, elder care is a prime uh, uh, target for companies creating uh, smart autonomous devices of various uh, of types. Um, we have huge problems with how the data is shared, where it goes, how it's controlled, um, how it's monetized. Um, but we also have uh, questions of accountability and transparency in there as well. So this idea of labeling uh, is it's, it's coming, it's there in the, in, the, in the technical discussions right now. It hasn't quite got past the yes, we need to do it stage, but um, that's, it's been a good area. Um, to Eric's point um, on strictly humanitarian law, I'm actually really encouraged by the fact that um, uh, a rights-based approach is being um, addressed uh, and taken into account by corporates uh, building. The large corporates, large vendors are starting to really uh, try and, and, and use international humanitarian law to create principles that they themselves embed in committees of review. Um, that's actually probably as powerful uh, as it would be to have uh, um, uh, them on other levels. And Anya and I have had a number of discussions about the impact of uh, uh, funds and investors who look to potential breaches of, of international and international humanitarian law as a then a trigger to divest. Um, if that's also a powerful uh, vector as as well. Um, and then finally, you know, four billion people in the world don't have access to the internet. Uh, Two point four don't have a billion people don't have access to sanitation, which is a second industrial revolution kind of breakthrough that saved many more lives than than anything that AI ever will. Um, However, um, I can say that uh, the health uses of artificial intelligence run into the same uh, investment and agency problems uh, or, uh, as all other healthcare investment, uh, which is that uh, it, it follows the money. And your number one area for AI research in healthcare is oncology. It's cancer treatment right now. That's because in the US, that's one of the, the biggest areas where you can make money. Um, I also mentioned that we have uh, an agricultural project at the moment uh, called, uh, it's an agriculture, it's a GIS, uh, um, a Geographic Information Systems project at the World Economic Forum called the Africa Data Cube, which is looking at creating almost a live updating uh, constant, continent-wide coverage uh, using satellite imagery uh, that presents the satellite imagery in a machine readable form so that you can apply artificial intelligence to um, uh, do crop monitoring, mapping, uh, erosion, waterways, land use changes massive upside in that application space. A huge opportunity for empowering local farmers and, and, and part of the agribusiness in, in a place, part of the world where it yields are well below potential. The biggest ethical challenge we have right now is the malicious use of that platform. Because if we are opening up a medium resolution, almost live updating platform which tracks what's happening on the ground across an entire continent, <laughs> Who gets to use that and, and how might they use it is a big problem and it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's something that with Nathaniel Raymond at the Harvard Humanitarian Institute and others we're really, really puzzling over because the upside is massive but it feels like Pandora's box. Right. On that note, uh, we are already running uh, over time. Uh, just uh, one of the key findings and um, takeaway maybe that tonight. Uh, discussion is that uh, we need to bridge the community, like the technical community, the policymaker, the social scientist community, and uh, some kind of conversion. The GCSP is very positioned for that because this institution is, has adopted a very forward-looking uh, approach to security by. Uh, uh, bringing people with very different background together. And we also have developed a, a fellowship initiative that brings people from the private sector, from the governments here for uh, a few months talking to uh, uh, the people and the GCSP, but also outside. And you mentioned uh, the, 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 the need to actually empower the new generation. We also have and the old. And the old, that's right. <laughs> and so at uh, the, the this fellowship initiative, we also have doctoral students. And so we are trying really to bring also different generation uh, to uh, together. 
So the next, uh, if you're interested in these issues, the next uh, deadline will probably be uh, the AI for Good Summit at ITU in two weeks, from the 15th to the 17th. And if you feel like on the 19th, but that will take place at Swissnext uh, San Francisco, the GCSP uh, in cooperation with ATH Zurich and Swissnext San Francisco organizes a one-day symposium on uh, brain-computer interfaces. And we'll discuss not just the technical aspect, we'll discuss the economic implication, the social implication, ethical implication as well as the security implication. And I will stop here. Uh, I thank you for coming uh, here to the GSSP. I thank those who are uh, watching us uh, online and I wish you all a very uh, nice evening and thank you for the, the panelists for attending this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you the panelists. We are very pleased to have uh, and then you tonight, and then now we invite everyone to go just after to the creative spark for the uh, for the reception. Thank you so much for attending this event. For you here in Geneva, and also you uh, live online on Facebook all over the world. Thank you so much. See you soon.